Welcome to this uh, lecture in our course on mechanical operations. In the last uh, couple of lectures, we have looked at flow past flow of gases and liquids past um, isolated particles, flow in pack beds and also movement of particles through fluids. And we just started discussing fluidization um, in the last lecture. So we will continue and uh, conclude our discussion on fluidization today. Again. Fluidization is a process that trans, uh, transforms a fixed bed into one where the bed particles become suspended in the fluid and actually become mobile. And the, um, the way that of course it happens is that when you have fluidization, eventually the pressure that is being exerted by the fluid on the particles exceeds the forces that are holding them together and thereby the particles become entrained and start flowing along with the fluid. I mentioned in the last lecture that the difference between a packed bed and a fluidized bed is that when you increase the flow rate in a fixed bed or a packed bed, there is a corresponding increase in the pressure drop whereas in a fluidized bed, the bed itself expands to account for the increased pressure or the increased velocity and so there is no change in the, in the pressure drop. So if you sketch this to show what is happening, so if you plot your superficial velocity V0, there are two properties that we can look at. One is delta P and the other is the length of the bed or height of the bed. And there is a transformation when you go from fixed to fluidized. So in the initial stage, as V0 increases in a, in a fixed bed, you have a linear increase. This is um, delta P, whereas L remains constant. Now as you keep increasing the velocity, at some point the particles become fluidized but at the same time they kind of retain contact with each other. So it is kind of an incipient fluidization condition and that marks a transition region. And at that point actually there is still no significant change in the bed length. But um, there is a, a change in delta P that you can still see. After this point, full fluidization sets in where the particles float apart and are entrained in the fluid. At that point, this becomes steady and this starts to increase, okay. Now what happens if you now reduce the flow rate? Will you follow the same curves? or will there be a hysteresis effect? Well, it turns out that when you reduce the pressure or when you reduce the flow rate, the initially the particles are packed very tightly. So the pressure drop characteristics are very different from a freshly prepared pack bed versus one which has been fluidized and now is settling back into a fixed bed condition. They just do not settle as compact a manner. So actually there will be a net increase in the height of the bed. It never returns to its original condition. There is always a delta and similarly the pressure drop itself will also be lower. So this is in this way and this is this way. This is this way and this is this way. So depending on whether you take a fixed bed and fluidize it or you take a fluidized bed and turn it into a fixed bed, there are slight differences in the final properties of the system. So in fact, if you want to test for the onset of fluidization, the way that it is done is not 
to simply take a fixed bed and keep increasing the superficial velocity until you start to see a fluidization condition, but rather first fluidize, fluidize it completely and then reduce the velocity until it settles back into a fixed condition. That is considered a more accurate metric of the velocity at which fluidization happens. In other words, you, you track the inverse phenomena rather than the forward phenomena. So if you do an experiment in lab on fluidized beds, the way you will check for onset of fluidization is by fully fluidizing it and then change the conditions back so that fluidization is absent. So clearly the um, V0m which is the minimum velocity for onset of fluidization is an important parameter. And you need to be you need to be able to estimate that for a given set of operating conditions. Another parameter that is uh, important here is the epsilon or the void fraction of the bed and again there is an epsilon m which is the void fraction at incipient fluidization. So in order to do this you can do a simple force balance on a bed. So you know fluidization bed by the way it, it kind of looks like this there is a what is known as a distributor plate that is mounted towards the bottom of this, um, of this bed and say gas will be entering through here and the particles will be packed in this column. So this distributor serves two purposes one is it supports the weight of the of the bed particles and secondly the perforations allow for uniform distribution of the gas that passes through the packed bed in order to promote fluidization. So if you if you look at this um, what happens at the fluidization condition is that there is a, a pressure drop which can be written as g times rho p minus rho times 1 minus epsilon times L times dA where dA is a you know differential cross sectional area of the bed and if you take delta P over L and let us consider unit area then this equals G times rho P minus rho times 1 minus epsilon. Now there is also if you recall we had derived the Ergon equation for delta P by L which um, looks like uh, 150 times mu times V0 divided by phi S squared dP squared times 1 minus epsilon squared by epsilon cubed plus 1.75 times rho times V0 squared divided by phi S times dP times 1 minus epsilon over epsilon cubed, right. So at the incipient fluidization condition you can equate these two. So you can write this as G times rho P minus rho times 1 minus epsilon M equals the um, right hand side okay. Once you do that it actually becomes a quadratic of course um, under the ins under these conditions you, the V0 you will substitute with the V0m and epsilon you will substitute with epsilon m and that will give you a quadratic equation for the superficial velocity at which fluidization begins okay. So if you remember the two terms here represent two different Reynolds number conditions right. So this is for laminar conditions for turbulent conditions or this is for low Reynolds number conditions and that is for high Reynolds number conditions. 
when you have fluidization involving very fine particles that is typically a low Reynolds number condition. So you can calculate the minimum fluidization velocity for fine particles by taking just the first term in the equation. So then it becomes G times rho P minus rho times 1 minus epsilon m equals 150 times mu V0 m over phi s squared dp squared times 1 minus epsilon m squared over epsilon m cubed. So cancel this and this. So and then you rewrite this. What we'll see is V0 m would go as dp squared over mu, right? Just rearrange this equation. In other words, for a bed that is composed primarily of very fine particles or a bed that is operating under conditions where Reynolds number is low in the order of 1 or so, less than 100, the superficial velocity for um, the minimum fluidization condition will scale roughly as particle size squared divided by the viscosity of the fluid. Now experimentally this has been tested and it turns out that the exponents are not exactly 2 and minus 1 and the reason for that is of course um, any modeling we do for such a complex phenomenon is somewhat of an idealized model and there can always be small effects. For example, the um, parameter of the sphericity index has multiple effects. You know, it's, it's in the numerator, in the denominator here, so it has a direct effect. But even indirectly, the way that particles fluidize depends very much on their shape. And some of these effects are somewhat qualitative and it's not easy to capture them in a mathematical form, but they will uh, influence the final dependence. So if you do experimentation uh, looking at if you vary the particle size and look at when fluidization happens or if you vary viscosity and look at when fluidization happens, you may not exactly follow this but it will be close. Now in the other extreme for large particles typically the Reynolds numbers are much higher and the second part of this equation will apply. So again if you do the substitution in that case what you will find is that the velocity uh, v0 m, so this is for low Reynolds number cases, for high Reynolds number cases, viscosity is not a parameter which is interesting for one thing. Uh, it basically says the viscous effects of the fluid in terms of affecting fluidization are absent once you go to high Reynolds number flow conditions. Um, it also says that v0 in this case would be uh, proportional to v0 m b dp to the power half, right? And just like we discussed yesterday for intermediate Reynolds numbers, the dependence of the superficial velocity for onset of fluidization, the dependence on particle size is likely to have an exponent that is somewhere between 2 and a half, so it is going to be somewhere close to a linear dependence on dp. So as a function of particle size, again if you plot this exponent you will see that it drops from 2 for very small sizes to 0.5 for very large sizes. Now one of the questions in fluidization always is how can we be sure that the particles will simply will not simply get picked up and taken out of the column that they won't flow out of the column. The reason for that actually is that the velocities the the, the fluidization velocities that you are talking about are actually much smaller than the settling velocities that the particles are experiencing. You can obtain that if you take the ratio of the settling velocity ut to the minimum fluidization velocity. You see it depends uh, the dependence of ut and the uh, vom on many of these parameters it is pretty much the same. It has a pretty much the same dependence on rho p minus rho, on dp and so on. So if you actually take the ratio 
you take the ratio ut versus v0m that is the terminal settling velocity over the minimum velocity for fluidization again in the low Reynolds number case this depends roughly on 1 minus epsilon squared over epsilon cubed. What that means is for let us say for a bed that is has a epsilon value of 0.5 which is fairly representative this ratio is obviously a pretty large number it is actually of the order of about 50. So under normal operating conditions the terminal settling velocity of a particle in the laminar flow or low Reynolds, Reynolds number range is roughly 50 times the velocity that is required for fluidization. So in other words you can set the velocity at 1 50th of the terminal velocity and you will still have fluidization. You will have to increase the velocity by 50 times above the velocity required for fluidization in order for that to start approaching the terminal velocity. So it is very unlikely unless you are operating in some very extreme conditions of very high fluidization that you will ever have sufficient uh, superficial velocity to carry settling particles out of the column. In fact there are some systems where you deliberately design for it it is called a continuous fluidization system where fluidization is used actually as a way to convey particles through your process. In that case you would want to set your uh, superficial velocity to 10 times the settling velocity so that every particle instead of settling gets carried away in this flow okay. It also implies that fine particles which typically result in low Reynolds number conditions are fairly difficult to elutriate out of the column. They are very difficult to remove from the column using a superficial velocity which again is interesting and somewhat counterintuitive because if you take this ratio for high Reynolds number cases large particles you will see that this um, same ratio goes roughly as 1 over epsilon to the power 3 by 2 or 1.5. So for the same epsilon value of 0.5 this multiplier for epsilon equals 0.5 is only about 7x or so. So a fixed bed that is composed of large particles there is a greater risk that if you do not control your fluidization velocity carefully you can approach a condition where the particles are being taken out of the column altogether. So that is one, one downside of having a packed bed with very large particles that is being operated under high Reynolds number conditions. However there are certain advantages also you know larger particle for one thing implies greater surface area and therefore in any fluidization column you know fluidization fluidized beds have a lot of advantages but they also have several disadvantages. The biggest advantage of a fluidized bed is that there is violent agitation right inside the system and that means that chemical reactions will be speeded up, heat transfer will be speeded up, mass transfer will be speeded up, momentum transfer will be speeded up. So but then in order to get there you have to keep increasing the fluidization velocity. The higher the fluidization velocity the more well mixed the column becomes and so the, the faster and more uniform the transport phenomena become. But the downside of a fluidized bed is that the phenomena only happen at points of contact between the fluid and the solid. So there can be vast areas of the column but nothing is going on the fluid is flowing particles are sitting there there is no process happening. Um, in fact you will what you will find is that fluidization using a gas and fluidization using a liquid have very different characteristics. When you fluidize a fixed bed using a liquid it is called particulate fluidization and it has certain very distinct characteristics. The fluidization is quite violent but it is also very uniform. So the entire fixed bed gets transformed into a fluidized bed 
and the environment around each particle will be approximately the same. And so the phenomena that you are trying to drive using the fluidization whether it is catalysis or whether it is um, combustion whatever will be very uniform. On the other hand if you are fluidizing using a gas the phenomenon is very different. Uh, it is known as aggregative fluidization or bubbling fluidization and basically what happens in the column is that the gas kind of behaves like bubble flow. So there are areas where there is good contact between the gas bubbles and the solid and the process that you are trying to drive happens. But then there are also large areas where the bubbles are just rising through the column and nothing is happening. You know there is no contact between the solid particles and the gas. So the solids fraction varies quite widely across the column. Wherever the solids are concentrated you have a very high solids fraction and it kind of behaves almost like a fixed bed whereas in other areas it is mostly the gas and there is very little solids fraction and it behaves like a fluidized bed in, a, in an extreme condition of operation. So if you are trying to do fluid dynamic modeling of particulate fluidization versus bubbling fluidization by the way the reason this was called aggregative fluidization originally was people thought that this, this different behavior in gases was because particles tended to agglomerate and that led to localized phenomena. But actually it turns out that there is no evidence that there is more agglomeration in gas fluidization compared to liquid fluidization and the real reason turned out to be the so called bubbling phenomenon. And, and by the way these bubbles especially if you have narrow columns they can get to be so large that they occupy the entire width of the column in which case the flow becomes what is known as slug flow. You get these large bubbles of the gas flowing through the column like slugs and they are interspersed with flow of solids and in the worst case there is no contact at all between the gas bubbles and the solids and there is no intermixing. So the modeling of the two is also very different in the, in the case of particulate fluidization you can look at it as a well mixed suspension of particles in a fluid. Whereas in the latter case you really have to treat it as a two dimensional flow you or two phase flow. One phase is the bubble phase and the other phase is the solids phase. In fact there is even something called um, three phase fluidized beds. In a three phase fluidized, fluidized bed you have a mixture of gas and liquid flowing through a solid column. Now, as you can imagine the modeling becomes even more complex and again depending on whether the primary phase is the gas or the primary phase is the liquid you can, you can have a particulate fluidization with some characteristics of bubbling fluidization or the other way around. So you can have a mix of both and your fluid dynamic modeling will have to kind of vary depending on the location in the column and whether the, the, the interface at that column is primarily between the gas and the solid or between the liquid and the solid. Okay. All right, so coming back to this um, clearly the what happens inside a fluidization column very much depends on the Reynolds number, the, the particle size. It also depends on the distribution design how well the gas phase uh, particularly is dispersed when it is introduced into the column. Ultimately the effect of fluidization is as we mentioned earlier an increase in the length of the of the bed and here again you have to be able to predict this increase in the length of the bed under various fluidization conditions and in order to do that we can go back to this expression delta P by L equals G times rho P minus rho times 1 minus epsilon under any fluidization condition. Now here if I just take again let us take these first two terms that is G times rho P minus rho times 1 minus epsilon and then take only the first part of this um, equation. The when we did it the first time we were looking at the velocity or superficial velocity for fluidization and its dependence on 
uh, parameters like dp and mu and so on. You can also rewrite this as an expression for 1 minus epsilon over epsilon cubed versus v0 under general conditions not under the minimum fluidization conditions but in general the same expression can be used to establish a dependence between the porosity epsilon and v0 and you will see that when you when you look at it this way there is actually a linear dependence of actually if you invert it epsilon cubed over 1 minus epsilon has a linear dependence on velocity right. So if you plot v0 versus epsilon cubed by 1 minus epsilon you will find that there is a straight line dependence again under low Reynolds, low Reynolds number conditions. Under high Reynolds number conditions if you do the same uh, kind of plotting it turns out that you really have to plot log v0 versus log epsilon and you will get a slope that is equal to some 1 over m. So in other words in this case epsilon to the power m goes as v0 where m is an exponent that again has to be determined experimentally. So this is for low Reynolds number conditions and this is for high Reynolds number conditions. In the case of low Reynolds number there is no question that the bed porosity epsilon cubed is related to the superficial velocity in a linear fashion through this expression. But in the case of high Reynolds number condition the dependence goes as it is an exponential dependence and this m value interestingly enough if you plot that m versus Reynolds number going from 0.1 to 10 to the power 3 it turns out that that has the same behavior as we saw in the last class where it varies from about 4.5 to 2.6 depending on the Reynolds number okay. So that gives you an idea of how the porosity of the bed changes as a function of v0 and from that of course you can estimate how the length of the bed itself will change as a function of v0. So these graphs give you the dependence of bed porosity on the superficial velocity. However, the effect of that on the bed length or bed height will depend on whether it is a particulate fluidization situation or whether it is a bubbling fluidization situation. The, the case of particulate fluidization is fairly easy to, to visualize because the entire bed behaves like fluid with, uh, with particles suspended in it and you can write L bed as Lm which is the length of the bed under minimum fluidization conditions times 1 minus epsilon o, uh, m over 1 minus epsilon and what you will find is that if you, if you examine this relationship uh, and compare it to this the bed length also has a linear dependence on v0 under particulate fluidization conditions where Reynolds numbers are small okay. So if you increase superficial velocity by 2 times the bed height will also increase by 2 times fairly straightforward dependence. Um, and then in the case where you have the um, so this is actually applies to both high Reynolds number and low Reynolds number conditions only requirement is it should be particulate fluidization where the entire bed is, flu is fluidized in a uniform fashion. However in the case where you have bubbling fluidization happening it turns out that 
the velocity of the gas in the column can actually be kind of decoupled into two contributions. So if, if you have particles that are suspended in a gas and you find that you have these bubble phase and then you have this particulate phase with fewer bubbles around them, the overall velocity that is happening in this column is now going to depend on two parameters. One is the bubble velocity itself, the rate at which the bubble is rising in the column and it is also going to depend on u0 which is the superficial, superficial velocity of the bed through the, the solid phase. Okay. So the effect on the height of the bed is actually now going to depend on two parameters. The bubbles themselves are rising at a certain velocity. So depending on the time of exposure, they would have reached a certain height in time t, you know, assuming that they are proceeding at a uniform velocity. Whereas this ut um, or u0 will have a dependence that uh, we, have, we have sketched earlier. So the question of the bed height depends on which of these two is the dominant phenomenon. And that very much depends on the size of the bubble for example. If it turns out that ub is a much larger value, in other words the bubbles are rising through the column much faster than the dispersed phase or, or the fluidized phase is, then the change in the height of the column will actually be dominated by the bubble rise phenomenon. Whereas if ub is smaller, no, best case it is 0. So there is no separate bubble phase you can observe. But by definition in bubbling fluidization, you do have visible bubbles rising through the column. But if the rate at which they are rising is much smaller than the rate at which the fluidized phase is rising, then you kind of go back to the you know, particulate fluidization situation. So in the case of, so this is for particulate fluidization. In the case of bubbling fluidization, the bed length actually has two contributions. It is it's UB minus U0 or V0M divided by UB minus U0. So it is actually a, a, a differential term between the velocity with which the bubbles are rising and the, the velocity with which the fluidized phase is rising. So that sets the, the height of the, of the bed. So as a function of V0, you may or may not get a linear dependence. The dependence may be less than linear or actually the, the dependence will not be less than linear. It can be greater than linear if the bubble phase happens to be moving at a very rapid uh, speed so on so through the column. So when we, when we look at what is going on inside a fluidized bed, the primary advantage as I said for a fluid bed is that it allows the solid phase and the fluid phase to be contacted at high velocities and as you probably have seen from your fluid mechanics course and so on, a high velocity typically implies things like high mixing, high mass transfer coefficient, high heat transfer coefficient and so on. But the, the key here is to operate the equipment in such a way that you optimize it. You want to keep the fluidization velocity as high as possible in order to get the maximum agitation and mixing inside the column but still keep it low enough so that you know for one thing this kind of separation of phases does not happen and secondly the particles do not start to become elutriated out of the column. If you look at the kind of equipment that is used in industry, there are really three major uses for fluidized bed, beds today. One is catalysis. There are many chemical processes particularly in the petrochemical industry where fluidized beds are used as a way of bringing particularly catalyzed uh, when you use catalysis as part of your process. The catalyst particles are typically included in the solid bed and the reactants are flow, flowed through the column either in one phase if they both happen to be gas and or liquid 
or in two phases. One of the reactants may be gas, the other reactant may be liquid and the catalyst may be a solid. So that is where you get into three phase fluid, fluidized bed kind of situations. Uh, the other application is regeneration of catalysts. Once you have used a catalyst once it gets poisoned but in uh, many cases these catalysts are very expensive materials and you want to be able to reuse them. So uh, this type of a fluidized bed arrangement can also be used to take catalyst particles that have been poisoned and flow a reactive gas or liquid over them so that the material that is adsorbed in the, um, in the catalyst particles can be leached out and the, the catalyst can be purified and reused. So that is a second application for fluidized beds. The third application is fluidized bed combustion. Again it turns out that in a, in a fluidized bed combustor you can get much higher combustion efficiencies and you can get much higher calorific value for example out of coal if you use it in a fluidized bed kind of a setup rather than the normal burning of coal um, and the reason for that is of course that the fluidization means that particles are getting entrained in the hot gases. So the time that is available for the particles to burn is much higher. The risk in fluidized bed combustion is again if the coal size particle size is small the, they can flow out of the, the burner without being fully combusted. So that has to be managed but in general fluidized bed combustion is quite widely used now in, in power plants and so on. Other applications for fluidized bed is simple adsorption you know the flowing fluid phase may have certain species that need to be adsorbed. Typically this is used for pollution removal. If you have contaminated water or you have contaminated or polluted air and you want to remove certain substances toxic substances for example from the air or the water you can flow them uh, through in a fluidized bed over adsorbing particles which can selectively remove, remove certain species. And so adsorption is, is another major application of uh, fluidization. Drying, uh, it turns out that if you have particles that need to be dried, the problem is if you have a large number of particles or particular material that needs to be dried, if you just have them in a heap obviously they are going to take a very long time to dry. So on the other hand if you can fluidize them so that there is separation between the particles and then you flow hot air for example as the gas phase in this, um, in this fluidized bed that can do a much more effective job of drying these particles. So drying is another phenomenon that is increasingly uh, where fluidized beds are, are being applied. The operation of fluidized beds I think does call for a certain expertise in the design phase. But once you have a stable fluidized bed uh, it does not require much intervention. You know fluidization is essentially a steady state process or at least a quasi steady process. So unless conditions change the state of fluidization is not going to change significantly provided your feed material remains about the same and you are not changing any of the operating parameters of the column. And so from an industry viewpoint fluidized beds offer a lot of advantages. The initial equipment cost, the initial install installation cost is obviously higher compared to a fixed bed. But long term the operating costs for a, for a fluidized bed are no more than for a fixed bed. But the effectiveness or efficiency of your operation can increase significantly under fluidized bed conditions compared to fixed bed conditions. And that is the reason why there is a preference you know if you have a process that can run either in a fixed bed mode or a fluidized bed mode the preference in industry is really to run it in a, in a fluidized bed mode. It is also good for chemical engineers because you know it gives you something to do that is kind of a very specific chemical engineering kind of a responsibility. In the case of certain processes you can actually run a process which starts out in a, in a fixed bed mode and then gets converted to a fluidized bed mode. This can have certain advantages when you know the initially having a fixed bed the biggest advantage is it gives you a high concentration of solids that is uniformly present in your column right. And if you have a fluid for example that has 
extremely high levels of certain impurities that you are trying to remove. The a good process may be to start with a fixed bed that will remove a large fraction of these impurities quickly and then go to a, a fluidized mode by increasing the superficial velocity which can enable you to remove the last remaining impurities from the fluid and also now operate the, the column in a more you know cost effective and, and more efficient manner. So combinations of uh, fixed beds and fluidized beds are possible. There are also cases where you know by the way I mentioned that particular fluidization and bubbling fluidization are the two modes of operation and particular fluidization is associated with liquids and bubbling fluidization with gases. It is not always true. Actually what it depends on is the density difference between the particle phase and the fluid phase. So you can have a liquid and if you are trying to operate it with a solid that is much heavier than the liquid that you are using, you can still get bubbling fluidization even in a liquid fluidized bed. And similarly you can have a you know gaseous uh, system for fluidization but if your solid phase has mass that is comparable to that of the gas or density that is comparable then even in a, in a gas, gas phase fluidized bed you can have particulate fluidization. So it is not so much dependent on the liquid versus gas but rather on the density difference. There are also now fluidization columns involving supercritical fluids. A supercritical fluid is a particular state of matter where the fluid has some properties of a gas and some properties of a liquid and it turns out that particularly in a fluidization application supercritical fluids can give you some of the advantages of a gas and some of the advantages of a liquid. And so this is another advancement in technology that is currently being explored and again supercritical fluids involve high initial investment or capital cost but the process efficiencies that they provide can sometimes outweigh these costs. So for particularly for separation of certain critical materials for example radioactive materials where you want to make sure that you have 100 percent separation, you want to use something like a subcritical fluid bed in order to ensure that you get 100 percent removal of whatever impurities you want to remove while still trying to minimize time and, and cost and so on. So you know as far as mechanical operations go fluidization or fluidized beds are a very important aspect of um, industry processes involving mechanical operations. So it is something that uh, we should all be familiar with okay. All right so that concludes our discussion of fluidization. Um, any questions? Okay so in the next uh, couple of lectures we will try to cover a couple more small topics in involving mechanical operations and that will conclude this course. Thank you.